Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and I'm glad you're joining me today. This is episode 121. It's April 28th, 2019. And today I'm going to be joined by gardener and author Pam Dolling as we talk about how year round gardening in a hoop house can increase yields and the quality of vegetables and extend the growing seasons. But before we jump into all that, how about some homestead updates? Uh, boy, it's been a busy week. Been been a real busy week on the homestead. We have some baby rabbits, and you know I don't care how many times that happens, and it happens you know a lot. It's still exciting, you know. Every time I get some rabbits, I'm like, oh, I got something to talk about because it just it thrills me, you know. I love getting some. I think she had six. I they were wiggling around so much. I re, I, I went down there, and you, you know, you see the nest box full of fur, and you see the the fur wiggling around, jumping, and, <laughs> and you're like, well, so you just stick your hand down there and try to count them, but they're moving around so much, I. Five or six. It wasn't a big, big litter, but it was good enough. Um, yeah, I got some more seeds in this week also. Uh, growing a couple different beans this year. I got some Chinese long beans and uh, uh, some different purple beans that I'd never had. They're a bush variety purple bean. I'm going to try them. They look pretty good. And uh, we got our seeds in for our teddy bear sunflowers. You know, my wife ain't quite the gardener I am. She she doesn't get quite as excited over gardening as I do. But, you know, when she sees something she really likes, she's like, oh, can we grow that? And she comes to me and says, hey, look at these teddy bear sunflowers. And I'm like, okay, click. <laughs> we bought them, <laughs> you know, in two seconds. Anything that gets her excited about gardening, I'm, I'm going to click on and bring it onto the homestead as quick as possible. So I got those started actually today in, in, in the uh, in the greenhouse. So we'll see how those go. They're a little bit shorter, but they're, they got a real um, fluffy type you know yellow head on them it's a little different i mean they don't look like an ordinary sunflower they're just they look a little different they're really pretty flowers but ones i got it said they get about i think two to three feet tall so something like that so you know that'd be kind of neat uh also i ordered some elderberry and some currants uh bushes i got a couple different variety of elderberry and a couple different varieties of currants coming to the homestead and and i got a couple places picked out for those because it's just a couple things i didn't have you know i got a lot of different kinds of berries and stuff but i didn't have either one of those things and uh, i wanted them both so uh got those coming they should be here this week sometime and i'll keep you up to date on how that goes but yeah lots of stuff going on uh mushroom spawns on its way i bought some um wine cap mushroom spawn that i'll be uh putting on i've got the shady part of the my backyard it's kind of behind my house here on the north side of my house and it goes kind of the way i got my fence is it kind of loops around the corner of my house on that north side and and there's just an area there that just we're not doing anything with and i thought boy this would just be a perfect place for some kind of bed you know it's just spaced right and it'd just be nice and but why can you grow i mean it maybe gets an hour of sunlight a day in the evening because of the way the sun tracks and um uh, you know i got thinking mushrooms you know we could put mushrooms there so i'm going to uh i'm gonna put hay on the uh the bottom you know a few inches of hay and then a few inches of wood chips uh hard wood chips uh, in there and then I'll inoculate it with the, uh, it's a sawdust spawn of the, of the, uh, wine cap, uh, mushrooms. And, um, yeah, I should have a nice little harvest of, uh, wine cap mushrooms over there. I'm excited about that. So, uh, yeah, that's just a few things we got going on around here uh, this week, but, um, let's just jump right into our main topic with Pam Dolling. Uh, she's been growing vegetables at the Twin Oaks community in central Virginia for 27 years. Uh, feeding 100 people from three and a half acres. Uh, she is the author of the Sustainable Market Farming and the Year Round Hoop House, and she's a contributing editor with Growing for Market magazine. She's a workshop presenter. She's a weekly blogger, and you've probably heard of her. <laughs> so uh, she's on the podcast today, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her journey into into uh, gardening. And uh, you know, we're going to talk about hoop houses a whole bunch. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. And with that, let's just jump right into our conversation with Pam. Well, Pam, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you. Now, you're the author of the year-round hoop house. It's uh, polytunnels for all seasons and climates, and we're going to talk a little bit about 
you know, how a hoop house can increase yields and the quality of vegetables and, and also provide a, a beautiful workplace and extend your harvest season. But before uh, we get into all that, I'd kind of just like to, to let you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the vegetable gardening and eventually started writing books on the subject. Yes. So uh, I'm an immigrant farmer, as you might be able to tell from my accent. I uh, <laughs> moved here about 27 years ago from the U.K., and I used to do gardening there as well. So my experience of gardening is uh, longer than my time here and covers more climates as well. Um, how I first got into growing vegetables, um, I, I was part of a group of people that I met at university, um, people that wanted to um, go back to the land. It was the 70s, back to the land movement mm-hmm. that really got me involved. Uh, and uh, I joined intentional communities, groups of people that are deliberately living together and working together uh, to, to cooperate and do more together. And um, my favorite kind of work is growing food, growing vegetables. Mm, yeah. And so that's what I've mostly been focused on in the last few decades anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um um, uh, so I'm at Twin Oaks Community, and we're in central Virginia, and uh, we're 100 people, and our vegetable gardens are three and a half acres. Mm. Uh, we also do other kinds of farming that's to support the community. We don't actually sell the, our food. It's for, for the community. Okay. Um, and I started out, um, my writing started out with record keeping, really, I suppose you could say, for our gardens, because I wanted to improve. You know, I wanted us to learn from what we'd done before, and we have a little motto, which is, never make the same mistake two years running. (laughs) And so (laughs) we would write things down, like when we planted, and how much, and what variety, and whether it did well. And so I had kept lots of records, and then I started writing monthly articles for Growing for Market magazine. Uh, it comes out 10 times a year, and it's for, for small-scale growers of vegetables and fruit and, ve- and flowers um, by other small-scale growers. And so I started writing for that, and it became a regular uh, monthly thing. And at some point, the editor said to me, oh, you must have written a book by now. And uh, I said, oh, no, 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 I don't think so. <laughs> and I sat down and listed the articles I'd written and the ones that, the, sort of the crops that were missing and the techniques that were missing. And I said to her, oh, I've written half a book. <laughs> and that uh, set me off on the path of writing the whole book. And that was my first book, Sustainable Market Farming, which came out in 2013. And the Hoop House book, which just came out uh, November 2018, um, was kind of what I've been learning since, since writing the first mm. book. The first book has a couple of short chapters that are about hoop house growing, um, but I realized that I had much more to say, that I'd been learning a lot since then, and uh, I could put that in writing as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Hoop House offers uh, many uh, advantages, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So you, you feel like that... Um well, I mean, obviously, you felt like it justified writing a whole other book because it's so different from, from just growing in the ground to, to taking things into a hoop house, right? Yes, it is different in some way, in many ways. But, uh, you know, if you've got basic outdoor growing skills, they, mm-hmm. they will carry forward into a hoop house. But there are some special tricks and some special challenges to deal with. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I didn't have any problem writing a whole other book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we should probably start off with just defining what a hoop house is, because there's greenhouses, there's high tunnels, there's I mean, polytunnels. I mean, what, are, what are the differences, or what is a hoop house exactly? Right. A hoop house is the same as a high tunnel. It used to be said that the, um, the academics and the researchers called them high tunnels, and the farmers called them hoop houses. But actually, of course, there's a lot of overlap. You know, a lot of mm-hmm. researchers are also growing their own food, and a lot of people growing their own food are also doing research. So hoop house and high tunnel is the same thing. Um, we added polytunnel into the subtitle because that's what they're called in a lot of other countries, like a lot of European okay. countries yeah. call these hoop houses. Um, they're different from greenhouses. I mean, they are a kind of greenhouse in mm-hmm. a way, but they're... Um, 
plastic sheeting. Yeah. And uh, greenhouses are often um, either glazed with glass or some kind of hard plastic and often have some sort of permanent structure, brickwork or blockwork or or, uh, timber framing, uh, whereas hoop houses are hoops, (laughs) usually galvanized steel, but there are hoop houses also made of lighter materials, so I recommend getting the steel if you you can run to that. Um, So they are regarded, often regarded uh, as temporary buildings in terms of getting planning permission and so on, okay. which makes life easier. Yeah. Well, in certain states, for sure, yeah. <laughs> it's very long term. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I just helped a friend put up, a, a not too far away from me here in Indiana, we, we built one out of uh, cattle panels and pallet wood. I mean, it's a, you know, it's like eight feet wide and 25 feet long but it, you know we covered it with the uh, with the plastic the poly uh uv plastic and uh, it's working out really well so far we just built that this year so i mean we had a little bit of a taste of, of that i have a small greenhouse at my house and um, yeah it is there is some differences there are some things you have to uh, to recognize and they're not a um, i think some people put a, a high tunnel or greenhouse up and they think it's kind of like this uh uh, piece of magic they're installing in their backyard that's going to just automatically make everything better but th- there are some things you need to know when you use one because in some ways they can if you don't know how to use one they can actually harm uh, what you're trying to do in some ways well that is true i mean they are i do think they are magic in some ways <laughs> yeah i mean sure ways. they'll get you know the stuff will get frozen in the winter mm-hmm. they're not that sort of magic but the power of the sun heating up during the day makes a lot of difference mm, yes. and does keep the soil warmer. Um, uh, there, yes, there are some things to be careful about. Well, of course, you have to irrigate. That's the, the most obvious. First mm-hmm. difference is that it's not going to rain in there, so the, um, the gardener or the grower has to provide the water and make sure they provide enough. Uh, that's the most obvious. Yeah, ven- keeps- ventilation's been, I've found, be pretty important, too, in yes. the hot summer days. <laughs> Yeah, ventilation in summer, uh, or even shading. I mean, mm, we put yeah. a big piece of shade cloth over ours for the summer. Yeah, we're just yeah. starting to talk now about uh, doing it. Usually, early early May is when we do that. Well, let's let's talk about that. How how does having a hoop house? I think it's pretty obvious, but how does having a hoop house really help a vegetable grower extend the season? I mean, it it obviously we just mentioned a few of those ways, but what else do you have to say about that? Oh, um, it's pretty amazing what you can grow uh, through the winter. I mean, we're in zone 7 for winter hardiness, so we don't use any inner row covers. We have double plastic hoop house, so two layers of plastic inflated by a little air blower, and that provides thermal insulation and also provides some extra strength. And that means um, that it stays Warmer in there at night, probably about 8 Fahrenheit degrees warmer at night in the winter. But a further um, in benefit is that the crops just don't get weather beaten. They don't mm. have the rain falling on them or the hail or the sleet or the freezing rain, and they don't get battered by winds. So you can eat a whole lot more of what you grow than you can with outdoor crops. So uh, now, would you you grow uh, what kind of crops you grow like year round in there, or is there anything you specifically grow year round, or is there certain things you grow in the summer and then certain things you grow in the winter? Right, we discovered from practice that we have kind of three crop seasons in the year, and so we have the winter, the cool weather crops, which are mostly salads and cooking greens, with some turnips and radishes and scallions. Mm-hmm. And we plant those in September and October, and we eat those during the winter until we get to late April, early May. And that's our first season. And then our second season is the early warm weather crops, like tomatoes and peppers and early cucumbers and early summer squash. And we plant those in March, middle of March or early April, and um, we harvest those. Uh, well, the tomatoes from the end of May, uh, the cucumbers and squash sooner than that. And we harvest those until we get to high summer, we call it. So end of July, we pull out all that stuff and we plant um, something like cowpeas or edamame, often a legume um, that will grow in hot weather. Mm-hmm. And that that we grow through the summer until it's, it's time to clear the beds again 
for the poor weather crops. Um, but if you're in a colder climate than us, you would just keep, probably want to keep those tomatoes and peppers going yeah. for summer. But for us, uh, we don't need to do that because they grow outside just fine once it gets hot enough. And we'd rather uh, pay attention. We have the luxury, because of the climate, really, of paying attention to crop rotation. And so pulling those out and uh, planting a legume to help the soil. Sure. So, so well, I guess yeah, I should ask you, you're, you're planting directly in the ground inside this, uh, in your hoop house. Oh, so yeah. You don't have any, like, raised ground. beds or anything like that, just right in the ground. Um, well, they're, they're hmm, the word, yeah, they're raised beds in that they are higher than the paths, but okay. they're not boxed-in beds. They don't have uh, hard edges. <laughs> okay, okay. Just yeah. for drainage purposes and... and yeah, so and keeping us on the paths. Um, <laughs> we've actually edged the beds with twine pinned down to the ground. Okay. To try and us from walking on the beds. Yeah, just keep it from getting it compacted, sure. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, you said you plowed it. I was just kind of curious what that meant exactly. You're just going there with a rototiller, or are you turning it by oh, hand, or what are you doing? No, uh, we don't. We do it all by hand. We don't. Okay. Um, we don't use a rototiller in there or tractor or anything. Okay. Just like a double digging uh, and and that kind of thing. No, we don't do that either. Uh, once a year, we do broad forking. Okay. We didn't yeah. do this at the beginning. It. Yeah. When we first put the hoop house up, we didn't realize we were going to need to loosen the soil up. But after about five years, we realized that the soil and the beds kind of slumped down and was mm. more compacted than ideal. So we did do a once a year broad forking, which doesn't turn the soil over. It just loosens it up. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I was wondering about that because I, I just know that uh, some people, you know, actually, I mean, they'll put the shells in, they put, you know, they'll they'll grow in boxes and container gardening and they'll build raised beds. They do. There's a lot of people do different things. And I've seen people just, yeah. you know, go in there and, and actually just plow the ground. I mean, they'll go into a rototiller or something and just loosen up the soil, maybe leave a path down the middle and a few in between and just, uh, you know, build it like that. I've seen, I've seen some different ways folks do it, but uh, yeah, I was wondering oh, about yeah. your setup. Right. Um, when we got our hoop house, we decided we wanted to try um, all manual work and uh, no digging, no till kind of thing, mm -hmm. a sort of no-till intensive planting yeah. um, arrangement. And we really like that. It works well for us. We're glad not to be working in there and subjecting ourselves and our food to um, gasoline fumes sure. or something like that. I understand but, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's true that some places, some People that do hoop houses on a big scale, they have end walls that open right up and they just drive the tractor right through and um, um, disc the soil. Yeah, I've seen that done, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I'm glad not to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't probably want to do that either. But to those who do, that's fine. It's your thing, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you say that a, a hoop house can it can do a lot. Of course, it can increase your yields, and and you know, and, and I've even heard you say that it, it can improve uh, crop quality year round. So, what do you mean by that? As far as increasing the yields and improving crop quality? Um, well, the crops grow much faster in mm -hmm. the hoop house, and so. Uh, you can get a lot more leaves off of a, a winter green, for instance, kale or, or one of the Asian greens. You can get a lot more leaves in the same amount of time. And there's a whole set of crops like um, kale, spinach, lettuce. They all will make some growth when the temperature is 40 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And that happens in a hoop house so much more of the time. Mm than it does outdoors. So they will be growing much faster, and that will increase the yields that way. What about crop quality? You say it's uh, it's better. Do you just think it because it's uh, you're keeping it away from uh, maybe rain and things, and, and so there's less disease issues? Is that what you're meaning by that? I was thinking of uh, the physical effects of the weather. Uh, it is true that some, some insect pests don't go in hoop houses so much, but on the other hand, there are some particular mm. ones to watch out for. You can have Bad trouble with aphids early in the spring. I was getting ready to say like it. <laughs> aphids. <laughs> yeah. Trade off, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know. I've noticed that uh, uh, gnats. We get gnats really bad in the greenhouse here. I don't know why that is, but I noticed that. Oh, that wow. I always, I always have trouble with that, and I have to do a, take some action against that from time to time. And just for some uh, reason, it attracts them. Right. Yeah, just we don't get those. 
Yeah, probably yeah. just the moisture in there, I would assume, in my area. I would moisture and, and yeah, maybe. Yeah. Not that they do a lot of damage, it's just kind of annoying. <laughs> right. Oh, we find it's easier to keep the deer out of the yeah. house than yeah. out of the garden. <laughs> they don't like to open doors too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And rabbits and things like that too. I mean, it, that's an issue even where I live. You know, you get wild rabbits and things, and they can they can come in and do a lot of damage as well. Yeah, yeah. I find it's easier to kind of see what's happening. Like we once had a groundhog tunnel under the um, baseboard and mm. under the walls and come in, but because we haven't got weeds and we haven't got grass growing in the paths and stuff, it's it's sort of more obvious. You can see a great big groundhog hole with no problem, right. <laughs> and then you know what you have to do. <laughs> so that's probably uh, another way you're increasing your yields and improving uh, crop quality is just you, you don't have the, the weed pressure and things like that taking up valuable space and nutrients out of your garden beds as well, right? Right, yes, yes. It's, it's easy to keep on top of the weeds in a mm-hmm. small enclosed area, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you find you have any trouble with pollination? Do you have to hand pollinate anything, or is there enough uh, like uh, pollinator right. action going on inside the hoop house to keep that going naturally? Right. We haven't had a problem with it. Um, um, ours is uh, oriented with the uh, end walls of the west and the east, and most of the breezes come in the west doors and go out the east end. So that seems to be enough, and we do get, insects in there you know mm-hmm. we get bees in there and um yeah all kinds of little little creatures it sure. doesn't seem to be an issue I, I sometimes wondered you know could we increase the uh yield of tomatoes if we did hand pollinate but i haven't got into that yet yeah i find with tomatoes way. you just almost just need to really shake them or give them a little bit of action shake or whatever them. and they kind of self-pollinate that way you don't really have to right. go in there and you know do it by hand too much but some some vegetables are a little more you know, picky and stuff, but also, uh, you know, because everything you don't have the heavy breezes and and maybe as much pollinator action, it could actually prevent a lot of cross pollination on on things like tomatoes and things that might be more apt to to it. Mm, possibly, yeah, yeah. 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 I could see that helping. Um, now, uh, do you uh, also use your uh, hoop house to uh, start uh, seeds for your outside garden, or do you just direct sell in the outside gardens, or how do you do that? Um, well, we have got. A regular greenhouse. Well, okay. it's, it's solar heated. It's uh, it's got a masonry north wall, and it's got double paned uh, reject patio doors uh, on the roof and the south walls, and so that's where we grow our starts. And we have two um, germination chambers. We call them when we're feeling posh. They're broken refrigerators, so they're really insulated boxes, and mm. then we heat those with incandescent light bulbs. So we okay. start plants in there and then move them out into the greenhouse and then move them to the outdoors. Um, but we do we do use the hoop house. Uh, in late January, we sow in the ground, in the hoop house, we sow spinach and kale and collards. And then we dig those up as bare root transplants and put those outdoors at the beginning of March. And that works really nicely and saves us a lot of greenhouse space you know, not needing to have flats of those three things. And um, the plants grow really easily. You know, they've got a lot of space for their roots mm-hmm. to go down. And so we don't have to worry about them drying out like you do with things in flats. So that that's an easy option. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. Now, do you think that there's a, a, a situation maybe where, where a, um, a polytunnel or hoop house doesn't work as good in some places as it does in others. Like, for instance, I mean, you, you say your your book, uh, the subtitle is Polytunnels for All Seasons and All Climates. Do you find that maybe in a, in a really hot climate, maybe like South Texas or something like that, a hoop house could be a little much? I mean, you're using shade cloth, but is does it still, would it be a beneficial um, a thing to have in, in a situation like that? Well, tell you what, I went to Jamaica on a farmer-to-farmer training thing, and they had hoop houses, and they're mm. in the tropics. And yeah. I said, why have you got hoop houses? And they said, they keep the heavy rain off. Okay. So this is an important other use of hoop houses, you know, as we're dealing with more heavy rains and so on. It's just to protect the crops from the rain. And then you can put shade cloth over. And when we put our shade cloth on, it's, um, I think ours is 50% shade, which is mm. maybe a little much for vegetables, but it's more pleasant in there under the shade cloth 
than it is outdoors right in the blazing sun in july and august and sure early December. yeah absolutely well, i could see yeah i could see that and i figured that'd be your answer i just was curious of, of your thoughts on that and you say you're using yeah. the, the double uh, plastic with the uh, air being blown in between and i noticed up in canada they'd use that a lot in, in real northern climates and i've seen some uh, i've watched some videos and things of folks with with setups similar to that and the really really cold climates and it's pretty toasty warm in there in the in the you know, most harsh of conditions I, I've seen at, at times. So I think that's really great that you got that kind of a setup. Right, yeah. I mean, as so long as the sun is shining, uh, it's going to warm up in there. Mm-hmm. And um, if you close the doors when the sun, sun stops shining, <laughs> or before that, you know, if it's, uh, it's like mid-afternoon in the winter, we would close the doors on the windows to kind of store a little bit of heat. You can't mm-hmm. store a lot with just plastic over the top of you, but you can store some, and you're storing some in the spoil, and that makes quite a bit of difference to the rate of growth. Have you ever used any kind of supplemental heat in your uh, hoop house at all? No, we don't, no. Yeah. What's your, do you have thoughts on that, though? Um, well, for us, it works fine. There are plenty of crops that grow in the conditions we've got in our mm-hmm. hoop house, and um, we'd rather not be using fossil fuels, for instance, mm-hmm. um, because of the environment and... and um, we can grow all the salads we need, all the cooking greens we need uh, through the winter. Uh, it, it's a matter of choosing appropriate crops, really, and not trying to do cucumbers too early and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so if you stick with what's going to work in the conditions you've got, you can get a lot of food. Yeah, I know a lot of folks do the, the, the passive solar thing where they'll have like barrels of, of water and, and things like that to try to hold the heat in a, in a greenhouse. I didn't know if he was practicing anything like that. We don't. I remember those ideas from the 70s. Um, really, I want to get as much food as possible. So we <laughs> you don't want to tie the space, water right. <laughs> I got we you. I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you, and, you, and you're going with the climate. You're not trying to grow tomatoes in, in January right. and things like that. No, I, I get that. Right. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. You know, you just kind of accept for what it is and get the most out of it. And it sounds like you're doing a great job. You're able to grow in there year round, uh, produce yeah. a lot of food, it sounds like, and with, with the setup you've got. Right. And people in climates that are colder than ours, they can make an inner tunnel of, um, or inner low tunnels over each bed mm-hmm, with yeah. uh, row cover, stuff like that. I mean, we're lucky enough not to need that except sure. a, few ra- a few rare nights when it's really cold. So we have it at the ready in the winter, and if it's going to be below 8 Fahrenheit outdoors, then we roll out the row covers for the night. But it's sort of just sporadic and maybe half a dozen times in the winter. Sure. It sounds like you got it down to a science. <laughs> you got the exact temperatures and you know, I guess all that journaling of all the things you've been doing and trying to keep up on your notes has really worked out for you. <laughs> it not only helped you write some books, but you can produce a lot of food. Yeah. 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 And people want to eat every day. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Sometimes even like two or three times a day. It's yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you, you've written this, you've written this book on hoop houses. What, what exactly do you cover in your book, the year round hoop house? Uh, well, it's divided kind of into three parts. The first part is uh, the design and siting and construction of hoop houses. So it covers that stuff. And then the second part is crops that you can grow in there. And the third part is, um, well, I call it keeping everything working well. So it's a combination of maintenance and troubleshooting and improvements that you can make. So it covers all that stuff. Sure. Okay. Well, sounds like it's a pretty thorough book, and uh, I'll definitely point people towards that in the show notes. I'll put a link to that. Well, I do want to mention the uh, grants from the Natural Resources Conservation Service while they last. So to get a grant, you do have to grow stuff in the ground. You can't make it uh, a place with benches and flats. So at least, you know, for the first few years, well, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Um, so you can apply to them and you can get a grant, and that's a big help. Um, second thing I would say is get as big a one as you've got the space for, um, because, the, well, not just you can grow more stuff in a bigger hoop house, but also the um, keeping the, the, the buffering of the conditions inside is better with a bigger one. Um, and, you know, if you don't end up growing 
food in a whole space, I'm sure you can store something there. You know. Yeah. You Nobody ever eat. said, I've got too big of a hoop house, did they? No. People <laughs> usually say, oh, I love this hoop house. Now I'm going to get a second one. Right. So, but that would be the next piece of advice is when you cite the first one, look to see if you have room for another one as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then I would say get a strong frame. I mean, if you're in a place with high winds, or heavy snow, you really want to pay attention to getting a strong frame. Sure. But um, also, you know, anywhere you are, really, you want it to last as long as possible. So um, get a good, solid structure with cross bracing and trusses and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and line up plenty of help um, to put it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, provide the pizza or whatever. Um, <laughs> be, be nice to the people who come and help. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it is, a, it is a pretty big job, you know, putting one up. And yeah. Yeah, it can be a – yeah, it's, it's, it's more than a one-person job, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've known people do it just with two people, but they've really um, focused on it. I mean, we when we put ours up, we were doing the reg, regular vegetable gardening in the mornings because we ended up putting it up in the summer and it was hot. And then we spent the afternoons putting up the hoop house. And we uh, we would have two or three or four people each day until it came time to put the plastic on. And then we got we got probably eight people, you know, or ten yeah. really. Do you, do, mean, you have the, do you happen to have the link from that uh, grant information that you were talking about? Uh, ooh. Um, or do you know where we could go to, to get well, the information? For that? Uh, you can get it through your extension service. It's Natural Resources Conservation Service. You can get it. Online, I'm just looking okay. through the index here. Um, oh, it's in your book? Yeah, it's in the book okay. somewhere. Okay. Awesome, just, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just point people to the that then. Without making too much background noise. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's in the book, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, NLCS. It's part of the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, you can it, you can easily find it online. You know, it's set up yeah. for that have the information about the grants well, there. I'll look it up and point folks to that as well. That, that could be some really valuable information for someone just wanting to get started uh, with, a, with a hoop house. Maybe don't have the, the funds to put up one, but they have the property and they have the they have the initiative to get started. Yeah, and even if you for some reason can't get a grant where you are, they have a whole website about, they call it the High Tunnel System Initiative. Okay. And uh, it's part of the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP. And um, it varies from state to state when the sign-up periods are and how many grants they're offering and all that. But they have useful information on the website about uh, what's going to work and what's going to... You don't want to buy a sort of fly-by-night flimsy kind of hoop house. (laughs) Although it sounds like you can make your own with cattle panels and pilot wood. (laughs) Well, you know, no doubt about it. They're not going to last... That's probably a a setup that's not going to last near as long, but for someone on a small budget, you know, wanting to build something cheap to get some... And mostly, like my friend, we built the one out of cattle panels. He's he's starting a market garden, but he's really just using that that hoop house to get things started. And he's just really starting a lot of seeds in there and things like that. It's working great for that, but, you know, yeah, if he ever wants to go larger, he definitely would want to get something a little higher quality, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And he's probably not going to grow year-round in that kind of a setup either. <laughs> Just kind of use it to get things started. Well, maybe kale. <laughs> yeah, kale. You know, some some really cool cool crop. Uh, yeah, something really cold hardy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, grow, uh, I grow a few greens in my greenhouse. But I'll tell you, and I'm in Indiana, but I have to, uh, I will stick like an electric heater or something on there on the coldest of nights to kind of keep it, you know, from freezing and stuff. And, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a really yeah, small are, greenhouse. Um, it doesn't take much, though. Yeah, there are some uh, websites of some of the um, colder northern states that, that they have. Uh, mm, I don't, I haven't read them fully, but there's a winter cold. What's it called? Cold weather hoop house, mm-hmm. cold weather greenhouse. I think um, there's a website hightunnels.org, O-R-G, and they have links to that and a lot of other great information oh, great. as well. Uh, awesome. I'll include that in the notes too. That'd be some really useful yeah, information. I think yeah, I've probably got. I've got a lot of resources at the back of my book, <laughs> okay. each chapter, and I've probably got that. Winter. Yeah, there's a lot of folks that, I mean, I think generally when people are sticking up hoop houses, it's because they're in a climate where they really want to extend that, that growing season into the colder months is, is the main reason, especially you know, in our area. Yeah. yeah. So early tomatoes and peppers are really nice too. Yes, yes. <laughs> and even absolutely. cucumbers and squashes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds like I said earlier, you sound like you got it, uh, you got it down to a science. You guys are, uh, you guys are providing a lot of food and you say a hundred people in your, in your community. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're not actually doing market gardening. You're just uh, you're just feeding the people there, huh? Right. It takes a lot of food to feed a hundred people. Yeah. yeah. In some ways, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like a CSA with one big box, one big basket. You know, we grow the food, we deliver <laughs> it to the kitchen, and then we hope the cooks will choose to use it sensibly. How's that work exactly? Just out of curiosity for the community, is, is everybody pretty much playing a part in working the gardens and the no, not necessarily. Like um, I mean, everybody plays their part in doing a fair share of work, and we've got that, you know, figured out what that needs mm-hmm. to be. But uh, some people are just not cut out for farming, and uh, we've got plenty of other kinds of jobs. Mm-hmm. And we run several small businesses. Um, we make tofu, twin oaks tofu, mm-hmm. and we make hammocks. And um, we do some seed growing, and we also um, do a business um, that's it's like the wholesale arm of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. We pack up seeds and sell them to stores. Yeah, yeah. Um, so people can work in those businesses, and people can do like the cooking and the cleaning, and people can choose the kinds of work that work well for them. People can do the taxes and the accounting and fix the vehicles, stuff I'm very glad not to have to do myself. And it, and it worked out with a hundred people. There's, you know, practically any job you could name. There's somebody that wants to do it, which is amazing. <laughs> so that's easy. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love that. Love that community yeah. environment. That's really neat. Yeah. And and you get a lot done, I would imagine, yeah, with that kind of a setup yeah. too. Yeah, I know. As a as a homesteader, you kind of get this mentality that you just got to do everything yourself all the time, you know. And you want to sure. be able to do things yourself, but there is something to be said about having a community alongside of you doing. You know, everybody has their own special yeah. uh, gifts and and and, and uh, abilities, and you know they can they can do it better than you, and you might be able to do something better than them. And if everybody works together, we can really yeah. accomplish a lot. Yeah. So I like yeah. that. So that's great. Well, your day, I will definitely include all of the uh, the links you mentioned, or as many as I can find, oh, yeah, that, and to your yeah. website, uh, your uh, sustainablemarketfarming.com, and the links to your book. It uh, sounds like a great book for anybody interested in uh, hoop houses uh, for all seasons and climates. And uh, definitely pass that information along. And I thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your thank information you. with us. It's been a pleasure. All right. Man, that's some great stuff from Pam there. Uh, all the things that we talked about, uh, I'll have links to in the show notes. Uh, Pam's website, sustainablemarketfarming.com. Her two books, The Year Round Hoop House, uh, subtitles Polytunnels for All Seasons and All Climates. And her first book that she actually wrote, Sustainable Market Farming, Intensive Vegetable Production on a Few Acres. Both of those books, I'll have links to those in the show notes. And then she also mentioned the uh, High Tunnel uh, System Initiative from through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'll have that link in the show notes and then another link she mentioned which was hightunnels.org I'll have all those links in the show notes so you don't have to worry about remembering them writing them down just head on over to smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 121 to get the show notes for this episode and um, yeah great stuff and you know I I having a greenhouse on my property really changed a lot about my homestead and and it you know like I said I said in the beginning there they don't fix everything they don't Maybe there's things you think that a, a greenhouse or a high tunnel or a polytunnel or whatever will, will do for you that it won't, but no doubt they can do a ton for you. And I can't even imagine not having my little greenhouse in my backyard right now. And I wish I had room for a big giant high tunnel to grow year round in. I really do. But yeah, great stuff from her. And she's got just a ton of knowledge. And she's been, as you heard, she's been doing it a long time. So check out her books and uh, there's a ton of good information in there. Um, let's jump into our homestead recipe of the week. This week's recipe uh, comes in from Echo, and she shares a family favorite recipe with us for Russian potato leek soup. And uh, she says 90 minute soft pretzels goes along with it. So she gives us a recipe for both. So, uh, Echo, take it away. Hi, my name is Echo, and this is a recipe for Russian potato leek soup that is actually uh, a family favorite. It goes along with 90-minute soft pretzels, so I will be giving you both recipes. So for the potato leek soup, it's three tablespoons of butter, two cups of chopped leeks, and two large carrots sliced, and you saute those together for about five minutes. You then add six cups of chicken broth, a tablespoon of dill, two teaspoons of salt, an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper, two pounds of potatoes that are diced, and one bay leaf. You add all of that and you simmer until the potatoes are just tender. Um, Then 
in a separate pan, you do a pound of fresh mushrooms. And I don't really like mushrooms, so I leave this part out. But um, you can add mushrooms and two tablespoons of butter. You saute those. And once those are nice and tender, you put those in with the soup. Once you're about ready to have the soup, you can do a cup of half and half and a quarter cup of flour. You mix that and then you stir that into the soup. You boil for a minute and then you serve it. I usually like to make everything but the half and half and flour and then I, I have that all ready beforehand and then right before we're ready to have supper is when I put the half and half and the flour in. To go along with it, we do 90 minute soft pretzels and these you dip in the soup and it's really yummy. Uh, for that, you have three and a half cups of flour, two tablespoons of sugar, a teaspoon of salt, and a one tablespoon or one package of dry yeast. Um, you mix uh, one cup of the flour, you do the sugar, salt, and yeast, and you heat with one cup of water and butter to about 120 degrees. You add the dry ingredients into the warm water and butter, and you mix it for two minutes. You then add the remaining flour a little at a time. And this is really one you want to use for like a kitchen mixer. Um, and you make this no, or dough. You knead it for five minutes and you cover it and then let it raise for about 40 minutes. After the 40 minutes, you divide the dough into 12 rolls and about 20 inches long and you make it look like a rope. And then you make your pretzel form. You place it on a greased sheet, you cover and let rest for another five minutes. Um, you want to mix up some egg yolk and water and you brush that on the top and then you sprinkle with coarse salt. We use kosher salt, but it's really good. And you bake it in the oven at 300, uh, 375 degrees for 15 minutes. Super good together. They're really nice and it is definitely one that we make every year. Um, I hope you like it. Thanks. Oh man, that sounds really good. Especially those pretzels. That that you made it sound really really simple. I'm going to have to give that a go, but yeah, good stuff. Uh if you want to send in your favorite homestead recipe, just get on get on your phone and kick open your uh, vo your audio recording app in there. Every phone, I think, pretty much has got a voice recorder in it and just record your recipe. Just, you know, tell us who you are and if you have something you want to promote like a Facebook page or a homestead name or a website or whatever, that's fine. And just tell us a recipe you like and you want to share with us. And uh, try to keep that recording between one and five minutes. And like I always say, it doesn't have to be perfect. When you're done recording it and satisfied with how it sounds, just email it to me at sthomestead at gmail.com. And I'll add it to a future episode. I love, love, love getting these recipes. Thank you, Echo, for that one today. Great stuff. And um, I look forward to the others we'll be getting. Some of you are sending in recipes uh, in text format. And, you know, as much as I like that, I really don't want to use them on the, the, you know, I might, um, post those somewhere else, maybe in the Facebook group or something. I don't know. I mean, if we get to where we don't have any, I might use them, but I'd rather you call those in. I'm trying to give us some, you have a little variety in the show and, uh, I do appreciate them and they sound great. I've had a couple of them come in like that and, and just emailed, uh, just in text and uh, they're, they look really, really good and I might use them somewhere. But I don't know that I want to use them in the podcast because I don't want to be the one reading your recipe. I want you to tell us your recipe. So, I mean, it's great stuff. Don't get me wrong. And I do appreciate it. But this is it's an audio recording. I want you to I want you to send in an audio of your favorite recipe. Uh, it gives us something different to listen to in the show. And I, I just really would like to have those in audio. Now, like I said, if we run out of we don't have any audio to play and that's what we got left. We might read a couple of those off. But in the meantime, I'd really like to have the uh, the audio versions of your of your favorite recipe. Uh, we do have a question for this week's podcast, and this week's question comes in from Sam. And Sam says, I'm a homesteader in western North Carolina. I just listened to your episode on your rabbitry. I can't remember what episode that is. I should have looked that up. Uh, my friend Yoko and I run a small rabbit farm, and I had a question about your watering setup. This past winter was super harsh, and we had a lot of trouble keeping water lines unfrozen. We used the nipple gravity feed, but everything shut down after low temps. How do you keep your rabbitry watered during the freezing winter months? And yeah, you're in um, you're in North Carolina. I'm in Indiana, so yeah, gravity feed systems are just pretty much out 
half the year here. Well, probably a good four months out of the year, maybe five months out of the year. We couldn't never use anything like that. So how do I do it? Well, I do it the hard way, Sam. <laughs> uh, they just don't work here. The gravity feed systems don't work, like I said. So I resort to swapping out water bottles frequently or using bowls. Now, if you use those like rubber bowls, those, uh, a lot of folks say those are even better. You can just go and kind of, you know, uh, push those around or whatever and it won't freeze and bust them. I use 32 ounce water bottles, just standard 32 ounce water bottles. I keep a bucket and I always downsize my rabbits in the winter. I don't have near as many. So I'm only carrying out like four water bottles, four or five water bottles. And I have a five gallon bucket. It's not even a five gallon bucket. It's probably, it's probably a three gallon bucket uh, that I have all those bottles in. And every day I uh, take that bucket and I take and fill up all the, uh, I thaw out all the bottles are in there for any still a little bit frozen. I refill them with water. I take them out there and I swap them out with the frozen water bottles and I bring those in the house. And then in the evening, I do the same thing. I do this morning and evening. I give them water twice a day, all winter long. And this is the hard way to do it. Now, if you have electricity running to your rabbitry, you can use heated water bottles or heated bowls. Um, here's the thing. I have some heated water bottles and I used to use them when I was colony raising rabbits because um, I just have a couple of them. And, and what I found was if you don't, uh, have a really heavy duty extension cord because you're not even supposed to use an extension cord with them um, or a really short, you know, heavy duty extension cord at that. It can't even be very long. They won't work. They won't work as well. Anyway, they won't heat up. Um, so you, they really, you want to plug them directly into an outlet. Well, you know, it's really difficult to have outlets at every, you know, cage because was, the cords on those things are only a couple feet long, probably maybe two and a half feet long. They're not very long. So, you know, they, because of their, their heater that uh, you can't, you know, run extension cords to them usually. Now, unless you got some really heavy duty extension cords, you can run them. Now, also another problem, you wouldn't have this problem because your rabbits are used to feeding off of a nipple, nipple system, which is the needle valve system. Like they bite down on the needle valve because that's how most of those are set up. If you have rabbits that are used to the um, the little ball bearing setup that where they actually push the little ball bearing in and they drink out of that, it's really hard to get a rabbit that's used to using those to drink out of the needle valve system. Uh, I've had a lot of people, I used to recommend those heated water bottles a lot, and a lot of people came back to me and said, we can't get our rabbits to drink out of them. And that is an issue. Um, now, if you've got rabbits that are really young and you start them out on that, they don't have any trouble, they'll always use it. Your rabbits, I'm sure, would. But you can buy heated water bottles. They're nice, and they even have the flip the tops on them where you can just top fill them. You know, you don't have to swap them out or bring them out to, to fill them up or take any, the cap off of them to fill them up. They just got a little pop-open tap on the top of them. You fill them up. And there's bowls, too, that you can do that with. I like bottles better than bowls because I can spill the bowls, you know, and, and stuff. But, yeah, they work. They work really well. They just, uh, you got to have a setup for it. You have an electrical system. Now, if you're running a rabbitry, it may be to your benefit to get an electrician to come in, run the conduit, put outlets at the cages, and hook up some water bottles. It's, you know, it depends on what you're, if you're selling pets and you're getting a little higher in or, you know, a price out of your rabbits or something like that. Yeah. It might be beneficial to do that for a couple months and run the electricity and buy the water bottles. They're a little expensive. I can't remember exactly how much they are. I think I bought them at a rule King or a TSC. They weren't too bad, but yeah, they're, they work, but I've given up on them cause I don't want to have to go buy more of them. I still have two of them that I don't even use. Um, but you know, I just use regular 32 ounce water bottles and I just, fill them up twice a day <laughs> and I thaw them out and I spend, you know, five minutes at the sink running hot water over them, trying to get the ice out of them. And yeah, it's a pain. It really is. But it's, it's, you know, it's part of what I do. And if, if I wanted to set up a system with electrical outlets and stuff at the cages, I could do that to me. It just isn't worth it. It's worth, you know, 10, 15 minutes morning and evening to water my rabbits. It's, it's not that big of a deal, but you know, it is something you have to do and that's how I do it. And and that may not be the answer you want to hear. You might want to hear how you can keep your gravity feed system from uh, freezing up. And honestly, I don't think there is a way you just can't use them when it's cold. Uh, so, I mean, you, there's people who will run heaters down the lines. They'll use like heat tape and stuff like that somewhere that thing's going to freeze up right at the valve. If nothing else, it will freeze up. It just, just seems like there's no way to keep them from, if it gets too cold, they'll freeze up. Um, that's just been my experience and what I've heard other people talk about with them. So, uh, I thank you for sending that in Sam and I hope that helps you with some ideas and, uh, you know, gives you, gives you a path to go down to keep your water bottles, uh, thawed out. 
If you want to submit a question for the podcast, you can send your questions in by calling or texting them in to our voicemail at 765-203-1949. And I look forward to your questions. I love getting them and answering them on the podcast. So if you have some, uh, if you have a question, just send it on in. This podcast is made possible by those who join our membership forum community. You can learn more about the benefits of membership by going to our website, smalltownhomestead.com. And clicking on become a member there in the menu. Uh, we also are really thankful for those who use our Amazon affiliate link and those who share our podcast with others. It's, you know, this thing grows every uh, week because you, because you share the podcast. So we really appreciate that you, when you tell other people about this podcast and when you leave reviews and on, on uh, Apple podcasts and other places, we really appreciate that as well. Um, and also we're really thankful for those companies who partner with us for advertising sponsorship and support through our membership. We could not do that without you. Um, again, the show notes for this episode can be found at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 121. I really appreciate you joining me today, folks. And until next time, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.